The Upper Missouri River in central Montana is a place of beauty and bravery. It is a place where sweeping vistas and quiet currents coexist with pioneering spirits and rugged optimism. The men and women who live here today share a special bond with the hardy souls who at the turn of the 20th century settled along the Missouri River within the area known as the Upper Missouri River Breaks National Monument. This is the story of the early homesteaders who traveled from across the United States and around the world, lured by wide open spaces and the promise of land to call their own. It is the story of early success and stubborn determination. It is the story about communities that grew and prospered along the river during the boom times. And it is the story about descendants of the early homesteaders who live in the Missouri River Breaks area today. This is the story of perseverance, personal history, and enduring family pride. The Upper Missouri River Breaks National Monument covers 375,000 acres of public land in north central Montana, from Fort Benton into the Charles M. Russell National Wildlife Refuge. Flowing through the monument is the 149-mile Upper Missouri National Wild and Scenic River. When people hear the breaks, they hear the rugged country. They hear the, the harsh landscape that provides the most beautiful sunrises, that provides the most stunning sunsets. And people don't get to experience that every day. So you come here and you get to feel that you've gone back 200 years with Lewis and Clark. You've gone back and seen where Chief Joseph and the Nez Perce crossed the river. To understand what attracted homesteaders to the stark beauty and unforgiving terrain of the Upper Missouri River, you need only look to the land. Montana experienced a boom in agricultural development by the turn of the 20th century. Above average rainfall in the area helped the crops flourish, so much so that by 1908, agriculture had replaced mining as Montana's leading industry. In addition to an abundance of crops, an abundance of land proved to be an irresistible draw for homesteaders. Congress passed the Homestead Act in 1862, which allowed settlers to claim 160 acres. In 1909, Congress made more land available to homesteaders when it passed the Enlarged Homestead Act. The bill doubled the amount of land a homesteader could claim from 160 acres to 320 acres. Word spread and folks flocked to the Missouri River breaks to stake their claims. By 1910, homestead filings in Montana increased from 7,500 to nearly 22,000. Settlers arrived daily from across the country and as far away as Eastern Europe, bringing high hopes and willing spirits. A homesteader would come out here and he, was be, he would be given 160 acres of land. And if he proved up on it in five years, he got title to it. That was a good incentive, it was a good program. And it brought lots and lots and lots of settlers into the country. But even in boom times, life along the river was challenging and unforgiving. Winters were harsh and isolated and summers were unbearably hot. Rattlesnakes were a common and unwelcome sight. But there were plenty of men and women who thrived on adventure and opportunity, 
and life in the Missouri River Breaks offered plenty of both. From 1910 until 1917, homesteaders enjoyed prosperous times and the promise of a better life. Their prosperity was brief. By 1917, drought moved into the breaks, ruining crops and homesteaders alike. The weather was a big thing. We had dry years and I don't care how much land they would have had, they couldn't have made a living on it. Today, you'll find many of the descendants of the Missouri River Breaks homesteaders still living and working on the land adjacent to the property their ancestors owned in the area that has now been designated as the Upper Missouri River Breaks National Monument. Each descendant has a story to tell about their family's unique history, and it's through these stories that the history of the Missouri River Breaks remains a vital link to our country's heritage. Well, my granddad was bullheaded as hell. <laughs> he came here from England, and it was his second trip here from England when he moved into the area east of Winifred and settled. That was 1910. There wasn't a Winifred until 1913, so you know how early he was. He came into the area, he settled there. He was real fortunate in being able to come up with just enough money to be able to add to his ranch pretty early on, and uh, he liked it. He liked what he was doing. Jim Arthur's sister, Patsy Simak, lives adjacent to the monument. She also has fond memories of the stories her grandparents told about their homesteading years. This is the homestead of my grandparents, James and Beatrice Arthur. They didn't actually live in this building. They used it for storage, and they later used it for a granary and I remember that my grandma had her feed in here for her chickens and they kept the grain and feed in here for the horses and the cattle. So I used to come in with my grandma and get feed for the chickens and help her. And we had a lot of fun going out and playing on the homestead and we had a lot of good times here. It's one of the only buildings on the place that are still standing that my grandfather built. So it has a lot of meaning for me. Patsy's husband, Bob Simak, has a homesteading history of his own. The buildings over there that are sitting on the rocks there, them are granaries where we used to store grain in them. And then underneath, they were used as a hog shed, mainly. And then the rock building on the west side there, that was the horse barn. This is a root cellar that my dad built. I don't know when it was built. It was probably built way back in the in the early 30s, I suppose. And uh, this is where we uh, stored the potatoes and the canned goods in it. I had a lot of fun here growing up, and whenever we come back up here, it brings back lots of good memories. Well, my folks, they came to the United States from uh, Croatia. In 1909, it was. They came to Montana from New York, where they got off the boat, and they came on train to uh, Great Falls. Then they uh, <clears throat> uh, homesteaded out here in, at this uh, place here in 1917. Jim Hill, the railroad man that built railroads into all of these countries. He built the railroad into Winterfit, Geraldine, Square Butte, all of those areas, and he put out a lot of propaganda to get these people to ride his railroad out and settle this area. It worked, but it sure wasn't in their best interest. They were trying to make a living on 160, possibly 320 if they were lucky enough to get an addition to their homestead. And there was just no way that they could produce enough on that land to make it. And that's what happened with most of the settlers that came into this country. They were here a very short period of time. They settled on land that they couldn't make a living on. They'd been given a lot of uh, poor information. They uh, just couldn't make a go of it. They packed up and they were gone in a few years. My folks raised a pretty big family here and they had a lot of kids and I guess it wouldn't have been that easy for them to pack up and leave. So they just stuck it out and hoped that it would get better. They went through some uh, real tough 
hard times back then. For Bob Anderson, the dream of keeping the farm in the family has become a reality. My grandfather and then my dad, uh, myself, then we go on down to my son and Rick's son and my great-grandson right now would be the sixth generation of Andersons that have been on this place. And the only reason that some of the families that are still here today was able to do that when all of these other homesteaders all were forced out, they were able to gather that land up and bring it in for, for practically nothing. Land was selling for 50 cents an acre. And uh, if a guy could come up with 100 bucks, he could buy a couple hundred acres. And those ranchers that did that was able to enlarge their ranches to the point when they did end up getting some favorable weather, they were able to do quite well with their businesses. A lot of those homesteaders proved up their homestead, bought as much money as they could, and got the heck out of here. My grandfather bought a lot of that stuff from the state, is what he did. Farming and ranching have sustained the Andersons through the years, through boom times and bust. We operated on the fact that we're going to improve what we have and make it so we can make a living on what we have. And it's quite rewarding to see what you can do with this land that's quite barren looking. Bob's grandson, Jeremy, is the latest addition in the Anderson clan to work in the family business. A college graduate, Jeremy left the farm to seek his fortune, only to discover that his life's passion lay waiting for him in his own backyard. Well, I love being out here. The work and the lifestyle is hard yet simple at the same time. You basically are responsible for what does and doesn't get done. You get to reap all the benefits or deal with all the loss. It teaches you to take care of what you got. It's rewarding. I had a son back in August. His birthday was just yesterday. He comes out and helps me service the combine. He rides around and he usually falls asleep. And uh, I don't know, it's just, it's just fun being with him. He keeps me company. Whether or not he'll want to come back to the ranch is years down the road. We'll find out. I was from Tennessee and it was when I got here it was 40 below. I guess I'm lucky. I adapt. And now it's my home. During the harvest, cooking the midday meal falls to Bob's wife, Kitty. Her home cooking recharges the men for their work in the field. 1950 I came here, married Bob and came here. He was a paratrooper and he miscalculated, came down my chimney, told me he was Santa and I fell for it. Okay, you know the routine. Life in the Breaks is a combination of modern day conveniences and time honored traditions. Rodeo is a chance for today's riders and wranglers to hone their skills, just as the early homesteaders who came before them. Then, as now, rodeos bring people together in a celebration of competition and community pride. You know, that's, that's how rodeo got its start, was you know, a bunch of guys got together and decided to see who had the best cow hands and you know, roping skills and things like that. And that's kind of where it got its start. 
you know, we still use those today at, you know, branding time or doctoring out in the field and things like that. It's nice to be able to ride up there and throw a loop and catch it and doctor it without having to drive it two or three miles to a corral somewhere. So those skills are still used every day on some ranches. Dana Darlington's great-grandmother homesteaded in Montana with her teenage son after her husband was killed in a hunting accident in Ohio. Dana still farms and ranches that property today. We're pretty blessed. We've got one of the most usable places along the river where as far as some, some good bottoms and uh, the brakes aren't real steep so the cattle can use the side hills pretty good. And with the river, I guess you always got water. And in this country, that's, that's more important than anything is to have good water. So it plays a very vital, vital part. The other day down there by the fence, there's carp swimming close to the surface. You know, most of that river country in this area looks just like it did when Lewis and Clark came through here. And uh, so as far as the future of that, I think uh, the rancher along the Missouri has shown that we take care of it and uh, we want it here for the next generation. To preserve and protect the spectacular array of biological, geological, and historical points of interest, President Clinton created the Upper Missouri River Breaks National Monument in 2001. BLM's been documenting the homesteads along the river for since the 80s, for about the last 25, 30 years. And now what we're trying to do, with the Wild and Scenic River designation, more of the homesteads were documented. And now with the monument, what we're trying to do is bring them into a little bit better focus as one of the valuable resources within the monument. So we're, we're documenting the homesteads, we're stabilizing and preserving some of them. We're trying to get more of the resources on the National Register of Historic Places to, to give them even more focus and more attention. This homestead, it's gone through a series of owners, starting with Gus Nelson. He settled here in, the, in 1916 and homesteaded, got the patent on it in 1921. Since then, it's gone through a series of owners. Then the BLM acquired it. BLM's invested in it, stabilizing it, replacing roofs, replacing logs so that visitors on the river and even hunters, fishermen coming down here can see it, walk around it, explore it. So this is an opportunity to educate the public and say, here are the values of these resources. And these are public resources, so let's take advantage of them, let's learn from them, let's use them and appreciate them. In many ways, life in the Missouri River breaks remains as rugged today as it was during the days of the early homesteaders. That's a reality facing future generations who will determine the fate of the ranches and towns adjacent to the Upper Missouri River Breaks National Monument. For Bob Anderson, the future of the family land rests with his grandson, Jeremy. I think Jeremy has every chance in the world uh, to do things that we didn't do. Jeremy is interested in doing fishing, guiding, and that kind of stuff. And I think he'll make a go of that right there. I spend a lot of time down here fishing. Pretty fortunate just to have a place on the river. Recreation on the river could be another form of income too. It's just the way of life that I mean, it, you know, I've, I've gone and done some different things and you just always end up, I mean, this is, this is what I want to do and this is hopefully I've got four kids and I hope, you know, I hope one of them wants to stay. You know, I don't know what all they're going to do with their lives, but it'd be nice if one of them wanted to stay and let them take a crack at it and hopefully one of their kids after that. So, just in the blood, I think it's just something we do.
a lot of dew last night, and it wasn't exactly dry yesterday. No. Oh, you probably cut by this afternoon, though, won't you? Probably two or three o'clock. Imagine. Farmers and ranchers are a real friendly bunch of people. They look after each other. They really do. If anybody has a problem, his neighbors are going to be there to help him out. I think that uh, you go a long ways to find a group of people that neighbor like these uh, people that live in this particular area do. That's one thing that makes it such a great place to live. It's a passion and a pride and a pioneering spirit that define the upper Missouri River breaks and the people who live there today. While the area's homesteaders endured lives of hardship and hard knocks, their descendants carry on the legacy of pride and perseverance. These people that are raised here really have a respect for what they got and they're proud of it. They're trying to protect it. For you folks to step up and show your support of what these kids have done, First come, first serve, so jump right in. Here it is right here, grand champion, and he's tired. We like this way of life out in the country for our own boss, and it's a good place to raise a family, and that's really why people are stayed out in this country and kept farming and ranching. It's a very good life. It's a very good life. It has its ups and downs like everything else, but um, as far as the quality of life, you just, you can't beat it. It's a unique life. I'm proud to have been involved in it. It is a treasure. I love this Missouri River. I've spent a lot of time on this river, and I really have a soft spot in my heart for the Missouri River in this country. You've gone back and you've, you've seen that families lived out here on the river. So this is a real opportunity to, to get back to what's real and more powerful. It's just beautiful here. I wouldn't want to live anywhere else. The country's nice, the people are nice, and I know there's been a lot of hard times, but those who've stayed here and gone on, raised families and their families, and there's third, fourth, fifth generations here, and I think that those who have stayed and stuck it out, I think have been very happy and very proud of those who did stay. The Upper Missouri Breaks is a timeless treasure in our American landscape, a place unlike anywhere else in the world. For the early homesteaders who tried to tame the land and their descendants who live in the Breaks area today, it is a place worth preserving, now and forever.